everybody. Um, wonderful to see so many known faces and friends on this call. Um, I should have been in Brazil by this time this year, but unfortunately, we all know what is uh, what is happening. So I'm missing my Caprianas and Fondacajo. So hopefully soon by the end of year, early next year. So a lot of you know me um, as Creative Travel, which of course is the parent company of our specialist brand, Jungle Sutra. On the call, I have Varun Mathur. Varun's official designation is head of the jungle. His responsibility is everything that Jungle Sutra uh, does. Some years ago, we decided to get into this very specialist area of wildlife, um, wildlife experiences in India. And Varun will talk a little bit about it uh, today. Jungle Sutra is virtuoso affiliated and creative traveler. Uh, creative travel is affiliated to Traveler Made. We have been around for 43 years and selling the destination through experiences is what um, we truly do best. It's all of India, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka, Tibet, and the Maldives. Jungle is not an English word. It is a word from my language, from our language, Hindi. It means very thick forest, wild. Sutra is Sanskrit for stories. Kama Sutra is the book of love. Jungle Sutra is our stories of the wild. And we established this, as I said, to show a very different side of the Indian subcontinent. Varun, why don't you talk about this one? A little bit Thank about you, Jungle Sutra. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking out the time. Uh, as Rajiv mentioned, we started this brand Jungle Sutra uh, a few years ago. Uh, up till then, what was happening uh, within the travel trade was um, India was seen as a cultural destination. And, um, you know, wildlife was just part of a larger adventure platform where, you know, one would do whitewater rafting, you'd go for treks and hikes, and, uh, you know, you might take uh, a couple of safaris to see the tiger. And I think that's what uh, the perception is in the larger world about uh, wildlife travel to India. And we wanted to change that because India is home to such a spectacular diversity of wildlife. And we wanted to showcase everything, not just the tiger, but, you know, also the other unique wildlife like elephants, rhinos, different types of primates. You know, we have the snow leopard. So there is really a lot that we wanted to showcase. And the deeper we went into it, uh, you know, more and more experiences came out of it. So we expanded the platform. And uh, today we not only cater to wildlife travel, but we also look at interest based travel. So you know, we find that a lot of people travel for their interests. So be it hiking, trekking, mountaineering, whitewater rafting. Uh, it's still a larger part of uh, adventure. But at the same time, we are looking at focused journeys for culinary, for, uh, you know, to go to places where there are no hotels, to do private campings. And um, I will get a little more into it. Uh, you know, so that's what that's what. Um, was at the back of our mind when we formed this uh, brand, Jungle Sutra. Rajiv, can we move to the next when slide? We talk, when we talk about India and the whole region, it is a journey of the senses. It's what you see, what you touch, what you smell, what you hear, and what you taste. And wherever you go, you feel that experience. I've been working in this business for 25 years, and I have met many guests, many media people, many celebrities, many travel professionals like yourselves. And sometimes people will say, Rajiv, too much sightseeing or so much traffic. The food is spicy. But in my 25 years, I have never met anybody who says I regret coming. At every corner, you feel something different. And especially when you start getting into the wildlife parks into the regions which are less populated, into central India, into our villages. You see all of this in more authentic ways. 
simpler, nicer, and genuine. Because what is very important to us in our culture is the concept of a Titi Deva Bhavo. The guest is God. When someone comes to your house, you have to treat them as God. You have to treat them as someone special. You have to make sure they have something to eat, something to drink. Nobody can leave from the house of an Indian feeling unloved, feeling not wanted. And this is very true in our hospitality business. I tell people, you can teach how to serve, but real service comes from the inside. And that's what makes us very unique. Varun, why don't you now take over on the various aspects and I will move the slides as right. we speak. Perfect. Uh, now, a lot of you um, would already be sending guests to uh, our part of the world. Uh, and uh, it has only become easier uh, over the last few years. Uh, I mean, even the visa process has become so much simpler. You do not have to go to an embassy. You do not have to take appointments. You can go online and uh, you can apply for a visa and the, uh, and the application can, uh, can be given about 120 days before uh, you, know, you plan your journey. And, uh, and they would send you your visa over email. You need to take a printout of the same and that has to be presented at the time of entry into India. So the process is uh, very simplified now. You can do it sitting at home. Uh, now, uh, I also want to touch upon what are the best times to travel to India. And uh, I know we've given uh, a, a small uh, indication of what are the best periods, uh, which, which is from November till March. Um, and, and the basic reason why uh, I have given, uh, you know, why we do not say that uh, May, June, October are great times to travel to India is largely because of the weather. Uh, April onwards, you know, uh, Indian summers would kick in and Indian summers, as a lot of you may already know, are quite harsh. It can get quite warm. Temperatures can go as high as 40, 45 degrees. Uh, it is a wonderful time to go looking for wildlife because it's far easier to find wildlife. Um, most of the wildlife comes to shrinking water holes, you know, as in other parts of the world. Uh, uh, however, it, it is too warm for the guests to travel in. And I think just for that reason, uh, you know, people do not prefer to travel in those warmer climates. October as a month is good. It's after the monsoons. July, August, September is monsoons. And most of the parks in India would be closed. Um, and that is largely because we have a lot of seasonal rivers which tend to flood. So we do not want a guest going in and then there's a, you know, a cloud burst and you get trapped inside a forest. So uh, keeping that in mind, the forest department closes uh, the parks on, uh, during these months. However, there are certain parks in South India and even popular parks like Ranthambore, Corbett have certain zones which remain open. But the large part of the park still remains closed. So uh, that's why we say that, you know, uh, November to March is the best time to travel to India. In my mind, you know, February would be an ideal time to travel for wildlife in India. Now again, we'll get deeper into it uh, once we talk about specific species that you are traveling for. But uh, I think for the time being, as a general rule, uh, you should plan wildlife travel between November and March. Uh, Rajiv, can we move to the next slide, please? So, um, you know, I spoke about India having uh, a, a, a spectacular wildlife uh, diversity. Now, not many people realize how much wildlife is there in India. Yes, you know, people say, yeah, you find a lot of things, but how much does it come to when you look at, you know, the global wildlife? So to give you an idea, about 10% of the world's wildlife can be found in India. And this is incredible because, you know, a whole continent of Africa uh, only has about, uh, you know, 25%. So um, given that India has incredible wildlife and, um, you know, uh, the main reason why we have so much wildlife, uh, Rajiv, can we move to the next slide, please? The, the reason why we have uh, so much wildlife is largely because we have different type of landscapes. 
Now, I spoke briefly about Africa, and I know a lot of people uh, send guests to uh, Africa. Uh, and it is a popular destination. Of course, they'll be traveling to other parts of the world as well for wildlife. But uh, I want to do a little comparison, not for any other reason, but largely to give you an idea of how much is there in India. So India is, you know, just uh, about 2% of the land area of the world, whereas Africa is 20% of the land area. But, you know, we have the maximum number of wildcat species in the world. There are about 38 species that you find uh, globally. And the entire continent of Africa only has 10 species. Whereas in India, you can find 15 species. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, people travel a lot to photograph different types of bears. Largely, their travel takes them to North America. But India has four of the eight species of bears that are found in the world. So again, an incredible destination if you're looking for unique species. We, uh, we have about 1250 species of birds, which is incredible. I know there are countries in uh, South America which, uh, which have much higher number of species. However, given, uh, uh, you know, given the amount that we have, it is, these are completely different variety that you have. So it can, be, uh, it can be an amazing destination for birders. Now, uh, I mentioned India has such a huge variety uh, of diversity because it has different types of landscapes. Um, now, uh, any landscape you can think of in any part of the world, we have something similar in India. And, uh, you know, it could be rainforest, mangrove forest, it can be, uh, you know, high altitude deserts, it can be deciduous forest, you name it, and we have something similar. And, uh, you know, this has given rise to an amazing amount of diversity. I already spoke about uh, wildcat species and the bear species. Um, Rajiv, can you move to the next slide where we have the species? Yeah, I'm following you, Varun. You just continue. Okay, perfect. Sorry, my screen is moving a little slower. Yeah, I'm following um, you. You continue. Okay. So um, let me tell you a little more about what is unique in our biodiversity. We have four species which I would like to call megafauna. You know, I want to change the word big five from uh, from from what is uh, represented in Africa. When I say megafauna, I'm talking about wild animals that are larger than a thousand kilograms. So we have the second largest rhino species in the world called the one horned rhinoceros. Very different from the white and the black rhinos that you find in Africa. We also have. Uh, you know, wild water buffaloes, which are very different from what you have uh, from the Cape buffalo that you find in Africa. Again, you know, you have uh, male specimens that can go over a thousand kilograms. We have something called gore in our traditional language. It is, uh, it is also referred to some as uh, the Indian bison. It is the largest form of cattle in the world. Uh, some males can weigh as, as much as 1500 kilograms. And the record for the height has gone up to six feet, nine inches at the shoulder. So these are massive animals. And of course, then you have the Asiatic elephant. We, we have an amazing diversity of butterflies. We have a huge, uh, you know, diversity of snakes, reptiles, amphibians. Now, um, uh, I'm not going to, uh, in terms of wildcat species, I spoke about the wildcats. Uh, we have everything from the largest wildcat in the world, which is the tiger, going all the way down to the smallest wildcat in the world, which is the rusty spotted cat on the bottom right corner of the screen. Uh, and, you know, the, the cats that can roar are part of a larger uh, group of wildcats called panthera. And there are five species that are found in this category. Uh, there is the tiger, lion, snow leopard, leopard, and the jaguar. And the only thing missing in India is the jaguar. Um, so, uh, Raji, can we move to the next slide? In terms birds. of bird species, depending on, you know, which corner of India you go to, you have a huge diversity. You know, uh, North India has very different types of birds when comparing to you know, birds found in desert areas and in dry regions. You have very different birds in southern India 
and there are almost 50 species that are found only in India and nowhere else. Now, moving on, I've already touched upon the bears. I'm going to quickly talk about one species of bear. On your bottom left corner, there is a bear that we have that we call the sloth bear. Now, the sloth bear is unique because it is only found in the Indian subcontinent and nowhere else in the world. Um, it is very unique because of its snout. The you, the gray snout that you see is is has perfectly evolved to get into termite mounds, and that's what constitutes almost 80% of its diet is termites and insects. It also would go up into the trees uh, to eat the bee larvas. And, uh, you know, uh, that part of the snout is very used to getting stung. And that's why, you know, you see it's all completely burnt out. Uh, so that's a little bit about the bears. The other bears that we have are the Himalayan brown bear. You have the sun bear and, of course, the Himalayan black bear. Uh, moving on, we have deer species as well as antelopes. As many of you would already know, Africa is largely, uh, uh, largely has antelope species. There are no deer species that you find, uh, that you find in uh, Africa. We have a very unique antelope species which is found nowhere else in the world called the Chosinga or the four-horned antelope. It is one of the only species in the world which has four horns instead of two. So um, that is very unique. Moving on... Uh, Talking about the dog family, uh, we have everything from the wild dogs to wolves to hyenas, foxes, jackals, but they are all quite different from what you see in other parts of the world. On the top left corner, if you see, we have uh, our Asiatic wild dogs. Uh, these are also called dhol in our local language. Uh, they are also referred to as whistling dogs based on the sound that they make when they communicate with one another. Behavior-wise, they are quite similar to the painted dogs of Africa, but uh, you know they are phenomenal hunters. They are probably the most successful hunters in the Indian jungles, and one can go on walking safaris, and it's amazing to see packs interacting with each other. You know, parents teaching skills to their pups. You know, regurgitating food, chasing after prey. Um, below the wild dogs, you have the hyena, uh, again found in a very unique landscape of India. These are largely scavengers and again, a very different species of hyena than what you usually end up seeing in Africa. Uh, similarly, you know, we would have different species of foxes, wolves. Not include insect species. There are about 870 species that are found only in India and nowhere else in the world. And uh, depending on what your guest's interest might be, it could be birding, it could be on reptiles, it could be about primates, butterflies. There is something for everybody when they're traveling to India. But of course, you will have a large number of guests traveling for the big cats. And uh, you know we have the tiger, the Asiatic lion. Uh, Asiatic lion is very unique because there is only one forest in India that has this species. Uh, the Asiatic lion is not found anywhere else in the world. So again, a very unique species to come and look for in India. Snow leopard, again, is very unique. I know there are other countries, uh, you know, such as Nepal, Bhutan, Tibet, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, and even Mongolia, Pakistan, which would have the snow leopard but it is easiest to find in the Indian subcontinent. So again, um, you know, we, we plan these programs very well uh, and we give you a very high uh, chance of seeing these beautiful wildcats. So, uh, so that's what makes India unique. But uh, moving on, I would like to talk about certain unique experiences and certain unique products that uh, make us unique. I'm going to begin with the snow leopard. Uh, it is a beautiful wild cat. And, you know, the, some of the first few programs that I'm going to talk about are also very sustainable. And they have been working very well for us for the last couple of years. They, they are very, very high on sustainability. And I'm going to give you the reasons why. Reason number one is, firstly, it is very responsible. It takes you away from the tiger reserves. Uh, 
so you're going up high in the Himalayas. Uh, again, not an experience for everybody, but again, very unique. So you're not going and into you know uh, very crowded areas. You're spreading out tourism, which is a very responsible way of traveling. At the same time, where we stay are small homestays. Now, this uh, image uh, that you see of the building over here, it is a small homestay called Snow Leopard Lodge. Of course, the uh, touches have been added uh, by us to make it more comfortable for the guests. At the same time, the lodge belongs to the locals. On the center image on the bottom, if you see, you see three people standing with scopes. They've been provided scopes, but they are the local boys that own these properties. And, uh, you know, so the money that you pay goes directly into local hands. We also hire them on as our trackers and uh, people who find the wildlife for us because, you know, they live in that region and they're very used to finding and tracking these animals. Of course, your guests will have a naturalist accompany them as well. So, you know, uh, we also organize interactions with Snow Leopard Conservancy. It's an NGO that works towards conservation. And part of the amount that you'd be paying for that package also goes to them as a compulsory donation. So we are trying to build a sustainable and a responsible way of traveling, which benefits the local community. It spreads out tourism. And of course, you're there having fun to try and find unique wildlife. Similarly, in Eastern Himalayas, we have another project on similar lines where we work with the locals and we work in a very uh, eco-friendly lodge called Habre's Nest. But in this place, we are going into, we are still trekking up to about 9,000 feet uh, to 10,000 feet. Uh, but, you know, it's a thickly forested area. It's a very different landscape. And you go here looking for a unique species called the red panda. This area also has very unique bird life. And uh, I was there last year in March. Uh, I, I had plans to go this year as well. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we couldn't travel. But... Um, I, if I'd seen 70 species in that forest, all 70 species were new to me. So again, like I mentioned, you know, you travel to different parts of the country and you see totally different wildlife. Now, um, moving on from uh, uh, the our sustainable and responsible programs, we also have your luxury camps and your comfortable, uh, you know, luxury lodges. And for your guests who are traveling to India for the first time, I would say you should begin the experience exploring Central India, Rajasthan, and maybe Gujarat. The reason why I uh, mention these is they have some of the best infrastructure there is in the country when it comes to wildlife travel. The lodges here are very comparable to the lodges that you'd find in Africa. And, uh, you know, just... Some of the slides that we've gone through recently give you the look and feel of these lodges. They are very uh, eco-friendly. Almost all of them would uh, would not use sing single-use plastic. Uh, they have trained naturalists um, uh, on on the panel, and uh, at the same time, you know they they really uh, get the guests to start thinking from a sustainable and a responsible way of living. Um, uh, Rajiv, if you can stay on this slide. No, the one before this. The one before this, please. Uh, so on the bottom right corner, Rajiv, can you just switch back? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Which, which anyway. slide? Which, which slide? Uh, the uh, one with three name? images on it. The one with three Im images on it. Uh, of the lodges. The... Just go to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, the one you flipped through quickly. <laughs> Before this. Sorry. The one the one with the Taj Lodge, the interior, with the bedroom look. Rajiv. Okay. Sorry, sorry about that, folks. So the so the lodge that I'm talking about, it is it is called Saraya Toria. And the reason why I want to show you this lodge is it is probably the most responsible lodge when it comes to ecotourism. So I just want to highlight how conscious people and lodge owners are to, uh, to some of these lodges. The property, yes, this one, Rajiv. The property, this is the bottom right image. Uh, the, the cottages um, that are made are made 100% of 
uh, mud. Uh, the walls are thick, so they maintain temperatures in a natural way. Uh, you find all the creature comforts that you're looking for. The entire lodge works on uh, solar electricity. Uh, the entire staff, except for the owners of the lodge, uh, are from the local villages and the communities nearby. And I'm telling you, when you travel there, in terms of cuisines, in terms of your experience, I mean, you will not know it is those local, local tribal people who are cooking these Western dishes for you. So no matter what you're looking for, you know, in terms of the type of dishes, they are able to make it over there. So they have been trained to that level. So uh, again, um, you know, like I said, we have some amazing experiences in this part of the world. Rajiv, can we move on to the experience slide now? Now, ah, yes, this one. So in terms of safari, when we do planning, uh, of your wildlife experience at Jungle Sutra, we like to include different type of safaris. I know a lot of people traveling to India, chasing the tiger, doing back-to-back -back Jeep safaris, and eventually that gets very tiring. You know, you are sitting about four to eight hours, depending on the number of safaris you do in a day, uh, in a Jeep, and, and you know, it, it's a bumpy ride. Um, and, you know, it gets monotonous after four or five days. So we like to break it up by doing canoe safaris, walking safaris, then night drives with spotlights. We have, you know, a couple of days treks through the park where you can camp inside the forest. So these, these different types of safaris also showcases very different elements of our forest. When you're walking, our naturalists can train you into how to track animals. And what that does is it, 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 uh, it lets the guest become more included in tracking you know right now sitting in the jeep you are like a spectator waiting for somebody to show you the tiger but when you're walking you are more alert because you are in a tiger reserve and and then you know you want to learn how to track an animal you start spotting snakes and you start spotting birds that can camouflage themselves very well so and and you know all of this makes for a much more wholesome wildlife experience our canoe safaris are very interesting because you don't have to paddle. There's somebody paddling for you. But then you can enjoy the bird life on the river. You can enjoy the crocodiles. For photographers, it is outstanding to photograph at such a low level when animals come down to drink. So it can be very unique ways of doing safaris. Can we move on to the next slide, please, Rajiv? Now, talking about photographers, we do work with a lot of uh, you know professional photographers who lead photography trips. I'm sure there are many photographers uh, who lead photography trips in your part of the world. And I'm sure a lot of you will be working with them. And it's not just for the larger mammals. We also do specialized macro photography. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we focus on nightscapes and other things. Uh, moving on, uh, you know, when, you, when I was traveling in Africa, I realized that uh, there are a lot of art tours that take place. So Jungle Sutra has introduced sculpture and art safaris. We work with uh, you know artists. This year on this slide, you can see um, there's a lady called Nick McMahon. Uh, on the top right corner, in the extreme right side, that's her. She's a wonderful sculpture artist based out of the UK who brought her group. And uh, these are just some uh, photographs from the tours that we had organized for them. You know, they come regularly with their guests. And the idea is you go on a safari, you come back, and then, you know, wh whichever um, uh, tour leader is traveling with you, if you have your own sculpture artist, or we can provide one, um, can teach them how to, you know, do uh, this artwork. Uh, so that's what makes, you know, they make excellent souvenirs. You learn a new skill set and you have fun doing what you enjoy doing. India is also home to about uh, 17 species of primates. So there are unique primate walks that can be organized in India. Um, now, again, you know, traveling within the country, um, uh, Rajiv, can you move to the next slide? Um, we are venturing into very remote areas. And uh, some of these remote areas are home to unique uh, tribal people. And, um, you know, apart from wildlife, we do include unique experiences where you can interact with the tribe, see how they live, uh, you know, what are schools like in these remote regions, what is their lifestyle like, you can go there, prepare a meal with them, eat in their homes. 
and, and they're quite unique depending on which part of the country that you travel to. So in on this slide, on the extreme left side, you see a Rabadi tribesman, which is the kind of tribe that you'd find in Western India. Uh, on the bottom center image are the, you know, are the Gond and the Bega tribes that you'd find in Central India. And all the other images are from Eastern India, Northeastern India, in a state called Nagaland, which is home to more than 18 different types of tribes. And a lot of them used to be headhunters. Um, and even today, you know, there's a festival called the Hornbill Festival, which might be very interesting for your guests, where, you know, 17, 18 tribes come together. And it's a unique place. It's a festival that takes place for the first 10 days of December. So you can come there and see how they cook, what kind of food they eat, how they live, what kind of music they listen to. Uh, and, you know, as you can see in these images, they are, they are very photogenic people and uh, they are quite different from what you expect Indians to be. But that is what India is. It is, uh, it is an amalgamation of unique people living all across the country. It is massive. So we should plan programs geographically. And uh, there is a lot to see in India beyond just Delhi, Agra, and Jaipur. Uh, moving on uh, to the next slide. This is perhaps uh, now this is perhaps that's the most unique experience that we do, and a lot of people do appreciate it. Uh, India is a vast country, as I've mentioned, and there are many places in India which are not even explored by the guests because there is no infrastructure. There are no hotels there. So what we do is uh, we organize mobile camps. Now, what these mobile camps do... Uh, this is a completely private camp that is set up for your guests. If there is just a couple then there'll be just one tent set up for your couple for that couple and but we will have all the manpower there to service them you know you will have butlers and based on which destination you are going to and what your interest areas are you can have naturalists over there historians archaeologists architects you know uh, people who can talk on textiles so there is really a lot to see you know and uh, there's a lot of culture that you can access to um when you're you know when, uh, through these mobile camps and that's what makes this experience very unique so in this slide you can see you know we have these ancient forts perhaps the largest port in india goes unexplored because there's no place to stay so which is the kalinger fort uh, close to central india and uh, you know we would set up camp but there are other places we can set up camp in um, in, in in tiger reserves which are not visited by many uh, you can go to remote regions, you know, uh, where village life is very interesting, places where hiking is a, is quite unique uh, and which could give you a mix of all these things, you know. So really a very, very unique experience, um, something that not many ex experience when they are traveling to India. Now, some of the experiences that have been popular, uh, I'm going to speak about... Uh, some of our popular destinations. And of course, when you think of wildlife in India, most of us think about Ranthambore. Uh, the main reason for that is if you take a look at the map, it is it lies very close to the Golden Triangle or Delhi, Agra, Jaipur that forms the Golden Triangle. And you can see Jaipur marked out uh, just above Savai Madhapur. Savai Madhapur is the city where Ranthambore Tiger Reserve is located. It's about three and a half hours away from Jaipur. So it fits in very well with the popular uh, itinerary. And most guests uh, who have traveled to India, I mean, almost 80 to 90% of the people who travel to India would be visiting this park. So this park does get crowded. But at the same time, uh, you know, the wildlife is quite interesting. And the landscape uh, and the ruins that kind of found in this place are quite interesting. If we move to the next slide, there are there is a fort which lies in the heart of the park and uh, this there are so there are this used to be a living fort at one point of time now it these are just ruins and uh, there are temples inside which are still visited by many people uh, now talking about this park you must understand we also have uh, different formats of vehicles and i'll give you a reasoning why we have the larger format vehicle it is not an ideal way of exploring the forest. However, 
you know india has a large population and our natural heritage is something that the government feels and all of us feel uh, should be appreciated by all and uh, so that with limited number of vehicles maximum number of people can have access to the park the government has launched these larger format vehicles each of these vehicles can seat 20 people and they are they are less expensive than the jeeps that we have now um, rajiv can you go back to the previous slide uh, where we have the jeep uh, i want to quickly talk about the jeeps that we have in india and the reason i'm talking about it is uh, africa has larger format vehicles so uh, uh you must keep in mind when you are planning this of course our team is here to assist you uh we do not although the government allows us to seat six guests in each jeep as you can see these are small jeeps we don't seat more than four guests per jeep uh and if there are photographers with larger lenses you know with their 600 mm or uh, 400 mm lenses we would advise you to put maximum two people per jeep uh because maneuverability becomes a problem uh so that's a little bit i wanted to showcase about uh, about uh, the transport and the vehicles that are used now uh, what also makes ranthambor unique is uh, the landscape you know i have already spoken about it 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 has hilly terrains it has lakes it has everything from you know sloth bears uh sloth bears to monkeys to deer family to have mongoose that you can find there crocodiles that you can find there and of course the highlight of the trip is going to be the tigers now um a big advantage of a uh, park being you know visited by many people is that the wildlife gets used to seeing uh tourists and so they are much more comfortable they realize that the tourists are not a threat they are still wild animals but uh, if if you have guests who are interested in photographing tigers uh this is a fantastic park to take your guests to because tigers are quite used to tourists and they do not shy away from the vehicles and quite often you can see them at close proximity but please do remember it does get crowded so your guests we need to do some expectation setting if you want to see the tiger in areas where there are very few tourists you'll probably have to travel to different regions but then the the tigers over there might not give you that much of a chance and might shy away from you so uh, that is something to keep in mind nevertheless you know over the years we uh, you know the tigers over here have been very well documented there are many documentary shot on them uh, and uh, literally every tiger in in the park has been given a name their histories have been uh, their 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 uh, family lines have been traced back uh, for the last 30 40 years at least ever since tourism has boomed in this part of the world and uh, and of course you know you want those photographs of tigers sitting in these unique uh, ruins that uh, ranthambore is home to but you know experiences can be done all across india india is home to over a thousand protected areas and each area of, of india offers very different uh, types of wildlife and you travel to different parts for different reasons uh i'm just going to quickly take you through some of the regions um i think as i mentioned uh you should begin with central india it is the most organized area it is it also does not get very crowded now there are five tiger reserves that one must focus on when they are here of course the popular ones a lot of you would have heard of which is bandargarh and kana and probably you would have heard of pench as well now uh, these three parks do tend to get more tourists than the other two parks which is satpura tiger reserve and panna however you must remember satpura tiger reserve and panna tiger reserve because there are fewer tourists we are able to do different types of safaris now safaris in india uh, are managed by the government and the government decides what kind of safaris are allowed they set the rules and regulations and i'm quickly going to cover uh, you know some operational features that might be important from a planning perspective uh, all our parks are government run and our parks uh, you know because of our population and uh, you know the the cities and the villages that have cropped up our parks today do not are not continuous forests so what happens is uh, 
the wildlife is limited to uh, to those particular parks and uh, the park size has become small so the migration cannot really be tracked very easily between the two parks there is migration happening but you cannot track it that easily so most of uh, the lodges that are there are there on the periphery of the park we feel this is a very responsible way of doing it you do not disturb the park in the smaller core area but you do do your safaris in this core area uh, however the animals do not know the boundaries there is no fencing so the animals do move to the buffer region as well where the uh, where the lodges are located uh, you travel um, now moving on from central india you travel to gujarat uh, gujarat is the westernmost side of india it is a very different landscape you have open grasslands and it is where you find the asiatic lion it is probably the only um, park gir national park is the only park where you find the asiatic lion in the world parks such as velvadar are unique savanna like grassland areas and they are home to wolves and hyenas it they are also parks which have uh, a very high number of antelope species Uh, which are quite rare in other parts of the country called the black buck the black buck is uh, similar to the thompson's gazelle if you've seen uh, you know uh, african wildlife if you are familiar with that now moving from gujarat we go to northern himalayas to a place called ladakh where we travel for the snow leopard this is a region where you travel not only for the snow leopard you also find the eurasian lynx you find the palas cat you find the uh, you find the himalayan wolf you find the himalayan fox you have brown bears in that region and an uh, ideal time to travel to this part would be the winter months because it becomes easier to this is a high altitude desert and there's not much uh, you know so you, it's it's very stony landscape so there are no tracks that can be followed so in snowfall animals leave tracks so it becomes easier for us to find them also uh, you know snow leopard is not white in color it is that slaty gray in color so it blends in very well with the stone so in winters it stands out against the snow as you see in the image which is there on this slide now uh, moving on uh, from here now this itinerary is uh, this is largely uh, the ramganga valley is the corbett region uh, uh, many of you may have heard about it it got its name from the famous uh, uh, famous uh, hunter who who then became uh, one of the leading conservationists in colonial india called jim corbett and he did so much for the park and uh, for the community that lives around the park that in order to honor him they named the park after him however the river that flows through is called the ram ganga and it is the beginning of uh, the himalayan range and thus we call it the foothills of the himalayas so 50% of india's bird life which is close to 600 species of birds can be found in this region and this diversity is there because you can find every everything from plains to lakes to rivers grasslands thick forested areas to mountainous areas uh, within this park and uh, and the surrounding region so thus you know there are many species of birds that migrate to this region because you have different types of terrains and different types uh, of terrains leads to different type of food supply that is there for you know species from around the world again a must do it is very close to delhi it's only about 4 and 1/2 hours drive from delhi so uh, it is again a popular park especially for uh, for uh, people of india traveling uh, over weekends however you know uh, it is a very unique landscape that must not be missed I did speak to you about Eastern India, uh, about a very responsible experience around the red panda. Um, so this particular program, we combined the red panda in Eastern India with Central India. Again, a very popular experience for us. It lets us, uh, you know, not only look for unique species, it also helps you see uh, popular species such as the tiger, the leopard, the sloth bear. um and then you again have red pandas and there are chances again it's very rare but there are chances of seeing black panthers and also cloudy leopards when you travel to eastern india to these hilly regions
Moving on to the next slide, what has worked well for us. Um, now, um, now th what this slide represents, what we've been doing is, I, you know, we've been launching so many new programs that we thought we should do set departures. Not everybody can understand, uh, you know, how much there is to see and do. And, and I know a lot of you have traveled to India and to various parts of India. However, there are so many experiences uh, to see that, uh, you know, one cannot do justice to them all. So as an inspiration, we did a brochure of set departures. And these are for unique, um, you know, interest-based tours. And, uh, you know, talking about wildlife, we have unique festivals in India that, that are related to wildlife, but again, are very unique and that can be very interesting for guests to see. Now, this particular uh, experience takes place in northern Kerala, uh, and it is a festival called Pulikali. Uh, it is a dance of the tiger where the locals would dress up as tigers and paint themselves, and they would dance in the streets. Again, a very, very uh, impressive uh, festival. And again, not a very, uh, not a festival that very many have heard of. So uh, it can be quite a unique addition to uh, the itineraries and programs that you put together. This takes place, uh, uh, you know, uh, during August. And, uh, uh, you know, again, most of our festivals, are the dates are decided uh, with the lunar calendar. So the dates keep changing each year. But, uh, you know, so it's not only about this festival. Uh, if you look at this map, Trisur is a region where we would have this festival. However, you can combine this quite easily with popular destinations uh, in Kerala, such as uh, Cochin. You can go to the backwaters of Kumarakom and then finally end in a beach resort in Mararikulam. And I think, uh, you know, we have wonderful properties in this region. Uh, a lot of you may have already experienced some part of this. Uh, so this is just to give you an idea that it's not just about that festival. Um, the festival is a big part of it, but at the same time, you will also be doing, uh, you know, uh, the regular cultural programs uh, that, uh, you know, that guests are looking out for or know India for. Uh, moving on uh, from this slide, uh, you know, uh, we have other similar programs as part of this brochure. Uh, we have culinary experiences, uh, Indian Cuisine is something that cannot be missed when anyone travels to India. And I'm sure a lot of you over there would agree with me. Uh, so we decided that, you know, we, we do a, a culinary uh, experience is a must. There are people who travel uh, for food. And, you know, all these experiences, uh, which are part of our set departures, have an expert leading them. And I think that is the USP of these programs. We have a different one each month. And... Uh, these again, like I said, act as an inspiration. So this here is an experience that is led by a culinary expert. Himendra runs a beautiful, unique uh, boutique property in Rajasthan. But his family is known for, you know, uh, their traditional Indian dishes. And uh, he travels much for culinary experience himself. So as you can see, you do visit uh, popular destinations in India but you also include unique experiences. For example, you'd be traveling to a place close to Mumbai called Nashik. Uh, Nashik is where we have our vineyards. So it is very interesting. Not many people realize India has started growing uh, their own grapes and producing its own wine. And um, it is becoming uh, quite popular. Sula wine is quite popular now. Uh, and uh, so you go and you stay at uh, the vineyards and you, you learn how you can pair Indian wine with uh, different Indian food or even with Western food. So uh, on similar lines, moving on, you know, uh, we have experiences around yoga and wellness. This experience is led by uh, 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 an expert called Mini Papar Shastri. Um, she's a yoga expert for the celebrities. She has her own TV show. Uh, uh, for yoga. So, um, you know, you are still traveling to uh, popular destinations in Kerala, as some of you would be familiar with this, with these uh, destinations. But at the same time, uh, a good chunk of your time is spent on wellness 
and yoga and since the expert is traveling with you you know you have access uh, to their consultations it is all built into this program at the same time you will be doing popular sightseeing in each destination as well and just quickly going through the next few slides you know um, we we have a similar experiences experience which is built around tea india is a very large tea growing area and uh, there is tea being grown in eastern india and in southern india and uh, darjeeling tea and assam tea that you hear of are regions where tea is grown so uh, this experience um, is led by anamika anamika comes from a family of tea growers they have their own tea estates and um, so you know you would have somebody like them lead the tour and you would be living at some of the tea estates and uh traveling uh, through this region which again offers a very different landscape and a very different experience you know in terms of culture um there is a lot of tea tasting done you know different types of teas grown you visit tea factories so it, it is a very in depth experience and um, and you know it is an experience which i feel will be popular with many now um these were some of the cultural experiences that we spoke about uh moving on you know similarly you know i've already spoken about the wildlife destination but i want to speak to you a little bit about um uh, wildlife experts so we do have all these experiences that i've spoken about feature in our uh, fixed departure program so if you do not have many takers for uh, wildlife and you are not very confident that wildlife is something that you can sell but why say no to some request that comes your way so it, if a request comes your way that person can easily be become a part of these groups so that is how you can plug these features in now all all these experiences are going to be uh, rajiv can you go back to the previous slide are going to be led by an expert and uh, you know uh, for example over here this particular program is led by a gentleman called surya ramachandran surya uh, has worked in lodges as a lodge naturalist he today uh, is a freelancer he has authored field guides for wildlife in this region and uh, he's also part of the team that has discovered new species in our indian jungles so you know that is the level of expertise that we are using to lead our tours um, now i i'm not going to go through each of these programs i just want to showcase some of the tour leaders you know we um, now in this particular program we have a gentleman uh, called varun devraj again you know a phenomenal naturalist you know his uh, he has worked in central india in south india he has led many many tourists over the last 10 to 15 years and uh, he travels to different parts of the country uh, today he's 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 worked with lodges in uh, you know in central india so he is a great guy to lead the tours uh, so that's just you know the next few slides are just examples of uh, i'm going to speak about this slide rajiv if you can keep this slide on about the lion uh, this uh, this just takes you to a different regions uh, sunny uh, is an expert that i wanted to highlight again um, sunny used to work with wwf he used to work with the forest department as a wildlife researcher so uh, those are the kind of uh, experts that we are using you know these are the people who've done research work so they know the area very well uh, so that's how we plan this they can also lead tours for fit guests as well uh, however we need to get their availability well in advance so uh, these are just some of the examples you know we've already spoken about these itineraries and programs so this was just to give you an introduction to what jungle sutra does and uh, you know what kind of experiences can be curated so but of course uh, you know hopefully we can uh, as and when the situation changes and we and and you know the markets open up and we we are ready to travel again we'd love for some of you to come down and explore our jungles so that you get a first hand experience you know there's nothing like a first hand experience i can go on and on about how wonderful our forests are but unless you experience them and you see our beautiful wildlife first hand um, i think that is what is going to be uh, what is going to convince you finally to you know start sending guests here to convince you of 
the experiences that can be curated in this region.